My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. My name's Ethan Bull, and today's quote is from Maya Angelou. And she said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. The Leader Assistant Podcast exists to encourage and challenge assistants to become confident, game-changing leader assistants. Welcome to episode 63. Hey everyone, thanks for listening to the Leader Assistant Podcast. Uh, Today I'm speaking with Ethan Bull. He's the co-founder of Pro Assisting, and I'm very excited to speak with him about remote EAs and virtual work, and yeah, it should be a good episode. Uh, But I wanted to encourage you to check out their website, proassisting.com. They have a compensation report uh, called the State of the Assistant 2020 Um, that's got some valuable information as you try to distinguish what tier you fall in, um, in your role, and maybe even a little bit of titling information on that as well. As far as compensation and titling goes, it's a good resource to check out, um, proassisting.com. Uh, also you can of course check out the show notes at leaderassistant.com slash 63 to get a link directly to that report. And yeah, hope you enjoy this conversation with Ethan. Actually, before I jump into the conversation, I wanted to let you know about our new Leader Assistant membership. It is $39 a month or $399 a year, which is like $33 a month or something like that. And we do one group coaching training webinar session every month, and you get access to the recordings of all of the sessions, even if you can't make them live. So you get access to the member resource library, which includes recordings from all of the sessions with the Q and A's and the training, um, and then also some bonus material and resources. So if you're interested in joining us, um, it's been a great group so far. Uh, again, it's just a way to get consistent professional development at an affordable price and with some other top EAs who are all about learning and developing themselves and really being leaders that the world needs. So you can check us out at members.leaderassistant.com. That's members.leaderassistant.com to check out the Leader Assistant membership. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Leader Assistant podcast. It's your host, Jeremy Burrows. And today I'm talking with Ethan Bull, who is co-founder of Pro Assisting, a remote executive assistant firm. Hey, Ethan, how are we doing? Really well, Jeremy. Thanks for having me on. And what part of the world are you in? Uh, I'm right outside of Rochester, New York, in upstate New York. Nice, nice. What was your very first job and what skills did you learn in that role that you still use today? I actually worked for my father in our family restaurant when I I started when I was in like really sixth grade, just bussing tables without getting paid. And then when I finally turned, I think it was 14 or 15, I got my work permit and I could, I could start bussing tables. So bussing tables was my first job, but growing up uh, in a family restaurant working for your father um, brings in a couple of different uh, things, if you will. Um, I, I, I really had a, a strong work ethic instilled in me early on um, by really wanting to perform well for my father. Um, and on top of that, working in a restaurant, I didn't really realize it at the time, but I was learning a lot about service and hospitality um, that has stuck with me ever since. And um, we would have the restaurant shopped every year by someone going undercover and coming in and they would rate everything from how much time it took the hostess to come over and greet them. Did they greet them with a smile? Um, how long did it take the server to get to them once they were first seated? All those little things. And we would review those reports once a year 
And I think back to that a lot um, in terms of where my idea of providing excellent service and hospitality comes from. And I, I didn't know it at the time, but, but that was a really awesome foundation. Hmm. That's awesome. So when did you kind of, how did your career pro- progress and when did you end up becoming an assistant? I went to Bentley University uh, in Waltham outside of Boston. It's kind of a specialty business school. And when I studied abroad in Australia, I was playing music in a band and I realized that I kind of wanted to try and marry my creative outlets with business. And so when I got back to Massachusetts, I started working for Warner Brother Records as an intern, a marketing intern. And through that job, I um, heard about a production assistant job in New York City working on the movie Addicted to Love. Um, And I decided to take that opportunity, and I I did. And working as a production assistant is really the low rung um, of the totem pole in entertainment and making films. And I, I learned a ton, and that really started me on my path. And, and from there, I worked other studio and independent productions. And then I, I worked for the William Morris Agency in New York City in the mailroom pushing a mail cart in their agent trainee program. And that's really where you, you, know, you get exposed to working um, for agents on their desk as their assistant. And... Um, that is really where I earned my stripes as an assistant and then decided to progress from there. Hmm. So how did you kind of work your way up to the, you know, more executive assistant role? Well, from William Morris, I, I went to USA films and I was second assistant to the chairman, um, there while we were making the movie traffic that won the Academy award that year. And um, it was really high pace. Um, we were um, working in New York, but working also L.A. hours, uh, West Coast hours as well. So we had the office covered for an extended period of time in the evening. Um, and and that, that really solidified my assistant skills from a hard skills standpoint. And um, after I... Uh, after being in that job for a year, I realized that while I love entertainment and I wanted to, you know, pursue some creative outlets, um, in entertainment, I felt that being an assistant in, in advertising, um, was a great way to do that. So I could be an assistant, um, at a big ad firm where the pressure wasn't so high as it was, um, assisting the chairman of a film studio, and I could I could focus my uh, on my creative outlets outside the office, and so um, yeah, and then and then my stint in advertising turned into 15 years. So <laughs> go figure. Um, and uh, and and I progressed there and and took on a number of different roles over the years as it went on. Hmm. So, what made you kind of stick with the role of? an EA versus kind of branching off and doing something else? Well, I, it's funny you ask that because I, I was presented that option from one of my bosses. He, he said, look, you know, what do you want to do? And he's like, if you want to just keep being my assistant and and progress there, that's great. We we would love that. But if you want to progress and, and try something else in the, in the company, that would be great too. And I decided to stick with being an EA, one, because I was – I felt that I was good at it and I had a great rapport with, with my boss and then my future boss there. And, um, there was a lot of security in, in being an executive assistant in the ad world, as opposed to being, um, on the account side or the creative side. Um, if you lose an account, um, a lot of people are let go, um, who worked on that account. So I was able to, to stay there for a, a long period of time. Um, create my own career path, which we can get into if you like. And again, it gave me the time outside of the office to write and direct um, short films. And uh, I published a graphic novel, um, worked with a number of producers on a couple of different screenplays. So I was doing all of that outside the office while my day job supported me. And um, I actually I was pretty good at it. So it worked out well. 
Nice. So, yeah, let's talk about the career path a little bit. So a lot of um, there's been a lot of discussion in the EA world and EA community about, you know, if if you get to the point where you're EA to the CEO at, you know, maybe a decent sized company, that's kind of like the ceiling in a lot of um, corporations. So, you know, there's there's the idea of, oh, well, you could go be a chief of staff in some places or maybe you go do a director of operations or but there's kind of this uh, talk about, okay, what else is, what's next for an EA uh, once you've been kind of the top at the top, which is EA to the CEO. So how did you kind of navigate that career path? And do you have any thoughts on um, kind of maybe what's, what's next for EAs who just love the EA role, but they want to keep growing in um, responsibilities and of course, compensation. Yeah. Um, for me, it, it, um, it, it happened gradually. Uh, I worked for the chief operating officer for a Big Ten ad agency on Madison Avenue. So, you know, you're talking um, big, big name clients, um, over a billion in revenue, uh, and multiple offices on, on multiple coasts. And um, through that time, what I saw and, and working with my boss, who was the chief operating officer, was that the human resource department, you know, and I found this in other companies as well, the human resource department, you know, really wants an awesome assistant support staff that, um, come in, do a great job for their, um, for their principals and, and have a smile on their face. Um, it's when you're dealing with, um, hiring and firing and training and setting expectations where the human resource departments that I've worked in, a lot of them focus all that, that energy on the executives and and at that level and and just want the assistant support staff to work and i get that i totally get that um but in a few discussions with my boss she was like look why don't you take over um interviewing um you know resource management deciding how many assistants are assisting how many executives um, we actually, I ended up overseeing about 12 assistants and we had a pool of about 60 executives that we supported. And so there you're talking about a five to one executive to assistant ratio. And in that kind of situation, you, you kind of have to put guardrails on, um, what the executives can actually use their assistants for. Cause if they could use them for anything and one assistant is assisting five people, they could get in the weeds really quickly. Um, so we put some guidelines in place and, and, you know, really focused what the role was, um, within the organization and then, you know, tried to raise that level of expectations, um, through training and, um, um, you know, talking about, uh, what really makes, you know, an exceptional assistant and how that, how that comes together. So I ended up, um, progressing from administrative assistant to executive assistant to senior executive assistant. And then um, the last three years of my time there, I was director of administrative services while I was also assisting the chief operating officer. So my suggestion for people who are in that top spot um, and want to look for a little more, um, you know, you got to look at your organization and maybe see where there are some deficiencies where you could step up and play a role and then have that conversation with hopefully the C-suite executive that you're assisting. Um, and I, I've come across quite a few executives and I've seen it happen where they have a great assistant and they see another role that they would be great for. And they promote them from within, and it does happen. Um, and it's about being being open and proactive from the assistant standpoint to the executive, saying, "Hey, this really interests me." Um, you know, if you have, you know, if you see something that that might be right for me, um, that'd be great. And and I've seen that happen before too. Yeah, that's great. So you said you kind of ran with finding assistance and even the interview process. So what, what should executives look for in an assistant? And what did you look for when you were building out that team? Um, a lot of it comes down to personality. Uh, when I am 
sitting across from someone, something as simple as the small talk, even before you get into the interview questions, how assertive is the handshake? Are they looking you in the eye? How warm are they? Um, all little things that, um, that I believe are playing a bigger role nowadays in what the role of an assistant really is. Um, I, I firmly believe that hard skills can be taught if you have someone who wants to learn them. Um, it's the soft skills and the emotional intelligence and the hospitality um, and having your ego in check um, to, to excel at the role. Um, I also got a little gun shy of, you know, candidates coming in and, and being all gung ho and, you know, you say, okay, well, where do you see yourself in five years? And they say, oh, I see myself being a vice president of, you know, um, account client services and, um, getting your VP stripes in five years when you started as an executive assistant in the advertising world is, is very ambitious. Um, and so, you know, not that it sends off a complete red flag, but it's something that, that I think of. And, um, so everything like that, something, you know, we're talking about, as I said, the, the emotional intelligence, the interpersonal skills, um, the, the soft skills, and then combined with the hard skills, um, we did do some extensive training on the hard skills. So I wasn't so concerned about that. I was more concerned about the, the actual person who's sitting across from me. So let's talk a little bit about what you're doing now. Uh, you and your wife started a company called Pro Assisting. Tell us a little bit about Pro Assisting and what your mission is. Yeah, so we started Pro Assisting back in 2009, actually. Um, my wife is a high-level executive assistant for high net worth individuals in the finance um, world. And um, at that time, we realized there was no training available um, that could take someone, a recent college graduate, um, who most likely had the hard skills, but didn't understand the role of the assistant and um, the soft skills needed to excel. So we created a training program that taught thousands of assistants. Um, uh, and it was online and um, it was through e-learning modules and a message board. And, and, and we worked that for, gosh, going on it was eight years. And then, um, back in 2018, last year, uh, we decided after we moved from New York city to upstate New York to make a pivot with the business and start, um, a remote executive assistance company. And so we, we pivoted pro assisting to that and rebranded, um, redid our website and, um, opened our doors and started taking clients. Nice. What's it like running a business with your wife? Uh, well, she's the CEO, so she is always in charge, and um, I am uh, completely fine with that. It actually works really well. And um, what's funny is that given that we both were executive assistants at, at a very high level for so many years in New York City, I mean, that's what our conversations were about around the dinner table at night anyway, was what's going on at work and what are you running into, what what issues. Um, we would hash that out and and... And so it's, it's been kind of a seamless transition and the work that we do at pro assisting, she has, you know, she has her three clients. I've got my three clients. And so we're pretty autonomous in that respect. But when, um, but when we're prospecting and talking with other prospects and talking with other partner executive assistants that we might want to work with, that's where we get to collaborate a little bit. So it's it's not too much stepping on toes and um given that she does have the ceo stripes she gets the final word and uh it's you know it's been a year and a half now it's going it's going really well awesome so you both have been eas for a long time so surely between the two of you you have a funny or crazy story of a time when you saved the day or just something entertaining that you could share? <laughs> um, entertaining. Um, well, I, I can go all the way back to my film days. Um, I was uh, personal assisting um, an actress on a, on a big movie with a lot of movie stars. I don't need to go through all the names and everything. But um, what happened was uh, one evening, the, um, the car that was holding the negative from that day, that last two days of shooting was broken into and the film was stolen. 
And so the production needed someone to get $8,000 and in cash and go to a location and, um, and, and get the film back. And they, um, they, they put that one on me. They said, uh, (laughs) Hey Ethan, come in here to the controller's office. Here's $8,000 in cash. Sign this little piece of paper. So, you know, you have it. And, um, yeah, I, in New York City, I went to the West Side and waited at this location, and um, it was all supposed to go down, and then it never happened. They never showed. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's going way back, and we never did get that that film back, and we had to reshoot those two days. Wow. Um, but it it gives you a little peek in terms of how um, how different tasks and projects can be for an assistant i guess wow they probably didn't show up because they thought that the cops would be there (laughs) probably and the cops weren't you know uh, the the production didn't care about the cops they just wanted the film back and it just didn't happen right Uh, so yeah wow so what's your you've we've talked a little bit about your model at pro assisting and how it's a little bit different than other remote assistant firms can you tell us a little bit about your model and, and how it differs? Yeah, I mean, um, there are a lot of great firms out there that um, are, are providing great service to their clients. Uh, and when we were pivoting from our training business to remote executive assistance, we, we did a deep dive on the whole industry. And um, our issue always came up against um, compensation uh, because we were, you know, when you're working in the industry for so long and your compensation is so high, trying to make a shift um, to working for a virtual company that's pretty big, uh, it it didn't seem possible in terms of what they're charging the clients and 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 how they're paying their assistants. So um, we decided to go a different route where we just charge a flat retainer, and um, our assistants are. Are compensated really well um, based on their experience. We we really only engage with assistants that have a number of years of C-suite experience or um, assisting an entrepreneur, and and then we, what we do is we provide full service. We don't um, we don't charge by the hour, and um, by full service I mean anything personal or business and. Um, we're touching our clients' business on a daily basis. And, and through that, they, they get support that can take the place of a full-time assistant sitting in the office next door. Um, and we are able to do that um, by really focusing on the three-to-one executive-to-assistant ratio. Through my experience in advertising and then further in healthcare, really found that um, a top-level executive assistant uh, is capable of handling three executives and, um, you're kind of cutting out all your downtime in the day, um, and, and focusing on three assist executives and, and providing them with full level support. So it's, it's an interesting, um, you know, sales process to talk to prospects and they're like, you know, well, how many hours is that? And it's, it's more along the lines of you get one third of the resource of a top level assistant. And what we found is that if you're, if you really are a great assistant, those, um, assisting three executives is, is kind of the sweet spot. And so that's, that's how we do it a little differently, um, than, than some of the other, uh, virtual assistant companies out there. Hmm. So, you talk about the term virtual versus remote and you, you know, you call your, um, team remote executive assistance. Why, why do you prefer the term remote over virtual? Well, what we found was that, uh, the term virtual assistant came up uh, a number of years ago and it was really connected to the online business world. Uh, you know, entrepreneurs who wanted someone to manage their email lists, who wanted someone to handle their, um, you know, social media accounts, uh, do some of their marketing, handle their onboarding processes for new members to their sites. Um, and so 
that that's kind of where the term virtual assistant originated. And really, we're not competing with virtual assistants in that way. Our clients come to us when they're either thinking about, do I hire someone full time or do I get someone in here on a remote basis? And um, that's how we compare ourselves to really hiring a full time assistant. And we are at the high end of the um, of the cost side for executives when when they're looking for a remote executive assistant. Um, but the difference in terminology, while it's slight, um, it, it does mean something to us, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So can you share a couple tips? Um, you know, you said you have a three to one ratio executives to assistant. Share a couple tips on how to manage multiple clients, multiple executives. Sure. Um, with our clients, we white label into their uh, email system. So um, have an email address and our email signature looks exactly like theirs um, on the same domain with their um, contacts calendar and, and email. And then we gain access to our principal's contacts calendar and email as well. And I find that having three separate email accounts is um, very helpful. Um, if you manage your inbox properly, uh, you, I, the way that I do it is I, I treat my inbox as a to-do list of sorts and um, have a very um, simplified filing system to where I can find any email very quickly on any account. And that transfers across all three accounts. So I work the same way whether I'm working on Outlook or whether I'm working on Google. Um, I even have a client who works on Lotus Notes, if you can believe that. Um, and uh, so, so we're very flexible in that way. But having three separate environments for each client or each principal is, um, is very helpful. When I was in the corporate world and I insisted multiple executives, um, that email inbox management is so key in terms of handling inbound requests um, and how you manage that. And I've always preferred a very simplified filing system um, differentiated by the executives that I'm serving. And um, that's always served me well. Um, and in terms of anything else beyond that, I, I hate to say it, but I, I still use a spiral notebook. Um, I use a spiral notebook and write down everything that, uh, that I need to do and, and I check it off. And, and then I always have a, um, the spiral notebook combined with how I manage my inbox is, is really how I stay on top of it. Hmm. Yeah. I love the idea of having, you know, the three different environments for the three different clients. Um, I'm a huge fan of that. I have that where I even have, you know, a totally different Chrome profile for my executive and then a different one for me. And then it's just, it just visually, I have a different background on his versus yep. mine. And, you know, it's yep. just, just so visually I can just, oh, okay, I'm, I'm looking at my email right now and now I'm looking at his email. Yeah. Which, which, which world am I in right now? Absolutely. Yeah. So What's maybe another tip um, on how you, maybe your simple system for managing uh, your client's email? I, I have, out of my three clients, I only have access to one of my client's uh, email. The other two don't um, feel it's necessary, and that's fine with me. Um, but in terms of the one that I do have, um, he has so he gets so many emails. I haven't really come in and changed anything in terms of how he does what he does. But what I've done was I, I, I've set up a lot of parameters for when certain emails from certain individuals or domains come in that I'm alerted to them. Hmm. So I can stay on top of um, all the inbound important stuff that's coming in and I don't have to bother with the full email inbox. I mean, I think he's got 40,000 emails in his inbox. Um, and, and that's just how a lot of executives work. And the way that we talk, both my wife and I, and also with our partner executive assistants is really a good assistant can, you know, shift and work 
the way that their executive wants to work as opposed to the other way around. Um, and so I've used the, um, the rules, uh, in, in the email program to, you know, send me those important emails, send certain emails to a specific folder that I check on a regular basis. And, um, in that way we, we stay on top of it and I haven't had to completely revamp how my boss looks at email, which, um, could be pretty daunting. Yeah. Sounds like uh, the old select all and archive all would come in handy for that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm I'm nervous about doing that though. You know, in terms of, you know, what's that email from uh, four months ago that we were talking about such and such? And um, yeah, no, I'm I'm constantly looking for those kind of emails. Um, so getting rid of everything, I don't know if it would work. But we have talked about. Um, archiving on a yearly basis, which mm-hmm. uh, could could alleviate that. Um, but but actually, we're it's it's working. You know, um, he always works on an iPad and an iPhone, and the search capabilities on those two devices are so fast nowadays. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's gotten really good to where he can let all those emails build up. But um, but I'm I'm more the point person for the important stuff that comes through and those stuff, that stuff is forwarded to me and I'm, I'm alerted to it immediately. Nice. Awesome. So what in your mind makes an assistant a leader? I think it's really subtle. And, uh, I, I would say that, you know, as an assistant, there are so many instances where you have to have tact and, um, again, leveraging your, your emotional intelligence to navigate certain situations. And so in, there are some instances where you may be acting as the leader, but nobody would recognize you as such. Um, it's simple things in terms of making suggestions when it's coming to complex travel or complex meeting arrangements, um, or setting up conferences, uh, based on, um, a high level executive assistance experience, they can suggest or guide the planning and the um, preparation in a certain direction. Um, and while they are leading, it might not appear to anyone that they are leading. Um, and and you know, as an assistant, you you know having your ego in check and understanding that that's fine. I don't need to be recognized as the leader. Um, but I know behind the scenes, I am pushing these, all these things forward and moving the ball forward. So yeah, Ethan, thanks so much for taking time out of your morning and chatting with me and sharing your uh, tips and stories uh, with my listeners. Uh, how can we find you online and support what you're up to? Yeah, sure. Um, our, our website is uh, proassisting.com, P-R-O-A-S-S-I-S. T-I-N-G.com. Um, you can check out our social feeds from there and learn a little bit more about Stephanie and myself and, and what we're up to. And um, if there are any um, experienced executive assistants who, who might want to try working remotely, uh, you can send a, a, an introductory email with your resume to info, I-N-F-O, at proassisting.com. Awesome. I'll put those links on the show notes so people can find you. And yeah, thanks again for chatting and we'll talk soon. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Thank you for listening, friends. You can check out the show notes at leaderassistant.com slash 63. And again, check out Ethan and Stephanie's company, Pro Assisting, at proassisting.com. Talk to you next time. Go Bullos.com.